direct retainer and indirect retainer. Before we discuss about the direct retainer and indirect retainer, I want you to think about the force to dislodge your RPD first. So we have two several forces uh, which will dislodge the RPD first. Is on the maxilla we have a gravity well, against the maxillary prosthesis. The second is happening once the denture is in function. When we chew in the food, when we have a sticky food, they will have some force try to dislodge the RPD. That's why we need some component to resist it, this dislodgement. So when we use those components of a removable partial dentures used to retain and prevent the dislodgement, which we call the direct retainer. The direct retainer consisted of a class assembly or precision attachment. The direct retainer's purpose is to provide a retention for the prosthesis. And it's a mainly primary retention uh, for the RPD. However, we still have some of the other component that will provide the secondary retention, which is the minor connectors, the guiding plan, and the denture base to the major connectors connections. The class design principle. When we design a clasp, First of all, we have to follow the principle of encirclement. The principle of encirclement is to talk about you should have more than 180 degrees in the greatest circumference of the tooth must be engaged by the class assembled. So you should provide a tooth contact at this in the three different areas encircling the tooth. So that will be occlusal rest, retentive clasp, and reciprocal clasp. If you couldn't know what this the principle of encirclement means, think about the koala. So koalas try to uh, rest over the tree. That's why it has to use its hands to hold the trunk. So this holding the more than 180 degrees will provide some retentions. We also have other basic principles when we design a direct retainer. First, the occlusal rest seat must be designed to prevent the movement of the clasp arm toward the cervical. So when you have a clasp, they definitely will combine with occlusal rest. The second, each retentive terminal should be opposed by a reciprocal component during placement and removable. So when we have direct retainers, we also will combine or accompany with a reciprocal component. In most of the cases, the retentive class should be bilaterally opposed because they can distribute the force evenly. The amount of retention should always be the minimum necessary to resist reasonable dislodging forces. So that's the KISS principle. Keep as simple as possible. If you put too much retention, then either you will hurt the tooth or the patient is hardly to remove the removable partial dentures. Also, when we have a distal extension basis, we would like to use the straight breaker design for the class retainer. The straight breaker design, which is the eye bar or roll wire clasp. So I want to reinforce the location of the retentive and reciprocal arm. So when we design the retentive arm, we hope the terminal end of the retentive arm could be placed in the gingival third of the crown or of the tubes. Because this location permits beta resistance to horizontal and torquing forces. Also, we want the reciprocal elements of the clasp should be located at the junction of the gingival and the middle third of the tubes. So why we need those uh, specific locations? So let's think about that. First, let's talk about why we need the reciprocal arm. The reciprocal 
is mean the manners in which one part of a process is made to counter the effect created by the other component. The reciprocal arm should be in contact during the time of retainer arm deformations. So what it means? When we have a direct retainer, the direct retainer need to pass through the hive contour, so to engage into the undercut. So when it passes through the hive contour, it will touch the tubes, so it will provide the torquing forces to the tubes. So we have to have something to encounter these torquing forces. That's why we need reciprocal arm. When we have a reciprocal arm, then can be stopped the tooth talking. And why we need the terminal end of retentive arm placed in the gingiva third of the tooth or of the crowns? Because the tooth was held by the PDL and the root. So when we have those force more close to the root, then the talking forces can be minimized. So let's take a look again. So reciprocal element of the cloud assembly should be located at the junction of the gingiva and the middle third of the tubes. So we hope when we have a retentive arm passing through the hive contour, then the reciprocal arm already be in the opposing side to hold the tubes types of direct retainer. So when we talk about the direct retainer, actually we can classify into uh, several different classifications. The first, it depends on where is it located. So we can divide it into intracoronal and extracoronal. The intracoronal means that those attachment, those direct retainer is into the tubes. Extracoronal means that those components are outside of the tubes. And then when we go for an intracoronal, it can be divided into precision or semi-precision attachment. And when we talk about the intracoronal, then we can also have attachment or the clasp assembly. Nowadays, we use more for the clasp assembly. And when we talk about the clasp assembly, we can uh, also divide it into two groups, depends on where it is located. So the intracoronals is talk about attachment. The attachment is like a key and keyways. It's very rigid. It can provide very good retention. However, because of uh, the technique sensitivities and the cost, so it's rarely to be used nowadays. The class assembly is which we use most of time in the removable partial dentures nowadays. So they include two parts. One is what we call the circumferential clasp. One is called a bar type. So what's the difference? So that's why we divide it depends on where it is located. So we can divide it into super bulge or info bulge. What's the bulge mean? The bulge actually is the high of contour. So when you look at the super bulge, or info bulge term. The super bulge actually is talk about when the direct retainers coming from the top of the hive contour. That will be the super bulge. And when the direct retainer is coming under the hive contour, that's the info bulge. So the circumferential clasp is the super bulge design, the bar type is the info bulge. So you can look at these pictures and take a look. I mark the hive contour, which is also the survey line by the yellow line. And you can see the circumferential clasp is coming from the top of the cuso and then to engage under the survey line, under the hive contour. So some part of it is above the hive contour. That's what we call the super bulge. And you can see all the bar type 
is coming from under the hive control. That's why we call it info bulge. So let's look through the detail of the class of assembly. First of all, let's talk about the bar type. Remember in the scene lab, when we talk about the bar type, I said the bar type is used to be RPI systems. The R is the meso occlusal rest, which can provide the support. And also because we put on the, the rest seat on the meso, so we also change the four cone locations, which provide a better token forces to the tubes. The P means that the distal proximal plate it can provide the stabilizations and the reciprocal aspect of the class assembly. The I means have I bar. The I bar will be ideally located in the middle facial part. You also want to locate the I bar in the Jumva third of the buckle surface of abutment in the point zero one inch undercut. The reason why we want the point zero one inch undercut because this type of uh, clasp is casting metal type. So you can see, remember what we talked earlier, this principle of encirclement, the RPI systems can provide a very good uh, holding to the tubes. Sometimes we are not able to have undercut in the middle buckle. So you may able to move that to the middle buckles. However, we don't like it to be in the distal buckles because when we have eye bar near the distal buckles, they'll be very close to the distal proximal plate, which means that your uh, principle of circlement will be affected. The other reason is because they will short the length of the eye bar, which means that you will decrease the flexibilities of the clasp. We also have some different guide plans design which be advocated by the different doctors, which I show you on the slide. However, this is a more advanced topic related to advanced programs, so I will not be explaining those in uh, my lectures now. Uh, I just want you to know in the UDM schools, then we use the cross design, which is showing on the upper right side. They also have some variations about the bar. We still most commonly use the I type, so which what we call RPI systems. However, depends on the different uh, undercut locations. It could be T modified T or Y shape. So the indication for this type of clasp is when we have a small degree of undercut, which means that we have 0.01 inch undercut existed in the cervical third of the abutment tubes, which may be approached from the Jumva directions. It can be used in the two supported indentures area, also will be able to use in distal attention space situations. Because it's coming from the Jumva directions, so for static reasons is more aesthetically than the circumferential clasp. Remember when you started to join your design in the cast, I told you that you should have some distance to be kept. So first, the, the top of the bar to the frigid margin of the tools should have at least two to three millimeters. In some textbook, it was mentioned four millimeters. However, the minimum will be two to three millimeters. Also, the bar type, the thickness of the bar should be at least half one millimeters. So in some circumstances, uh, we will not be able to design the bar type. The first is when the tooth has excessive buckle or lingual tilt. So you are not able to find a proper undercut locations. The second is when the tooth or tissue have a severe undercut, the, the bar clasp usually is anonymous to the tongue and the cheek may trap the food debris. It also has some problems when we have a shallow vestibule, means that from the frigid margin to the bottom 
of the vestibule is less than 4 to 5 mm, which means that if you want to keep what we just discussed, the thickness of the bar and the distance from the bar to the ventral margins is impossible. So in those circumstances, you're not able to design the bulk type. That's why some people develop to the RPA systems. Because we are not able to do an eye bar. So they think about why not we just combine the circumferential class to replace the eye bar, but we still keep mesial rest and distal proximal plate. So you will have mesial rest, distal proximal plate, and the circumferential class. So what uh, which will we call RPA systems. However, when you have these systems, it's no reciprocal arms which will be necessary to prevent the tooth torquing. So this is not ideal class design for distal extension RPD. That's why eventually we come, uh, we come out to a combination clasp. The combination clasp is we still use the circumferential clasp shape. However, we change the material. We use the raw wire to have the clasp, not the casting metal. So, because we use the raw wire material for our retentive clasp, and we also use the casting metal for our reciprocal clasp. That's why we call the combination clasp, because we use two different types of material. And this combination clasp is used on the abutment tooth adjacent to a distal extension basis or on a weak abutment when the bar type direct retainer is contraindicated. The reason we, uh, we like the combination clasp more than the RPA system because the raw wire clasp can provide some flexibilities and adjustabilities, so it will be given the maximum flexibilities on the distal extension basis. Now, let's take a look for the circumferential clasp. The circumferential clasp is the most logical clasp to be used with all two supported removable partial dentures. Remember, I just mentioned the eye bar, the bar type clasp is, could be used for two spawn and the distal extensions, RPD systems. However, when we compare the circumferential clasp to the bar type clasp, it has some disadvantage. First, it has more two surface is covered by the circumferential clasp than the bar clasp arm. The second means that it has more metals will be displayed compared to the bar class arm. Due to its half-rounded form of the circumferential clasp, so it's more rigid, but it also means that it prevents us to do adjustments to decrease or increase retentions. So the correct form for the circumferential class means that you should have one retentive class arm opposed by a non-retentive reciprocal arm on the opposing side. And your retentive arm should look like she shape. The undercut should be located on the gingiva third of the tubes because it was close to the root. However, to prevent its disturbance to the fusion margins, the terminal end of the clasp should at least one millimeter away from fusion margins. In order to provide the better reciprocal functions, the reciprocal arm will be likely to be located in the middle third of the tooth or the junction of the gingiva and the middle third. So let's take a look at some incorrect form for the circumferential clasp. You can see on the left side, if you put the C shape reverse, this is not a good idea because when the clasp try to move, it might hurt the gingiva. Also, in the middle, 
you can see if you draw your class too straight, this straight arm configuration will provide a poor approach to the retentive area, also will provide less resistance to dislodgement. On the right, when we design a terminal portion of a retentive clasp, you should know it should be at least one millimeter away from freedom margin. If it's too close, you might cause the gingival recession. So remember when I uh, talk about the eye bar, the bar type, I said it's an ideal design for distal extension basis. However, when I mentioned the circumferential clasp, I said just only be ideal for the two spawn RPD. What's the reason why we like to have the bar type uh, in the distal extension RPD? Because when we take a look, when we have a distal extension, it means that on the posterior dentures area, when we chewing the food, the dentures, the RPD will have some rotations. When we have a rotations, all the class assembling will be more move measly. So, when the circumferential clasp is moving more measly, what happens? More part of the circumferential clasp engaging into the undercut. When it engaging into the undercut, it means that you will provide more talking forces to the distal abutment tubes. However, the eye bar systems, because it will be moved away from the tubes, so it will provide less talking forces to the tubes. So when we have a distal extension RPD, then we will more likely to have a bar type systems on the distal abutments rather than to put the circumferential clasp. So let's talk about some variations about the circumferential clasp. We have ring clasp. The ring clasp is to be used when the proximal undercut cannot be approached. And also, it will be more likely to be used when we have a lingual tilting mandibular molars. Remember in the synap, you have one case will fall into this criteria, so you need to design a ring clasp. However, this class covers excessively amount of the two surface, so sometimes it could be less aesthetic. So the journal form for the ring clasp has two rest seat. Because the clasp itself will be very long, so if you don't have two rest seat, then that will be too flexible and will not have a good resistance. It sometimes also will come in uh, with a supporting strap. However, when you design a ring clasp at this, you should have two rest seat and start it from the reciprocal arm and come into the retentive arm. However, the reciprocal arm or retentive arm locations will be still followed by the regular rules of the circumferential clasp. We also have embrasure clasp. It used to be used in the Kennedy class 2 or Kennedy class 3 without the modification cases. Because when we don't have a dental area available on the opposing side, it's hardly for us to, dis uh, to design the circumferential clasp or the eyebrow systems. So it comes out to use the embrasure area to have embrasure clasp. I would like it to ask you to think the embrasure clasp is kind of like two combined circumferential clasp. One is to engage on the meso, one is to engage on the distal. I remember in the rest and rest seat lectures, I talk about the interproximal rest seat preparation. So interproximal race seat preparation is to use for the embrasure clasp. I remember when I talk about the preparations, I said you should treat it as you prep two separate rest seat preparations, just 
next to each other. However, we need to do some modifications, which means that we have to extend it both buccally and lingually to accommodate the retentive arm and the reciprocal clasp arm. However, even we do more extended opening the contact on the buccal and linguals, we still want to keep some contact area for those two teeth because it will provide us more resistance for the rest and rest seat. And remember, the embrasure class should have two retentive arm and two reciprocal arm, and which need to be bilateral or, diagon or diagonally opposed, which will provide a better retentions and reciprocal functions. So we just uh, described the ring class and the embrasure class, which is uh, two very common variations for the regular circumvention class. However, we also have uh, four different rare circumventional cloud design, which is talked into uh, the textbook. However, we are rarely to use those nowadays, so I just want you to know they have some different design which you might able to use. However, due to uh, the complexities and the difficulty uh, for the fabrications, Nowadays, it's rarely to be used for the circumvention class design. So when we take a look for the class assembling, which uh, could be divided uh, by three different parts. One is the rest. The rest is to provide the support. It could be located on the cuso, on the lingual, or in sisos. If you uh, forgot those, you can refer to a rest and resis part uh, of the lectures. Also, we have uh, some minor connectors to connect the rest and the class to the major connectors. Those minor connectors can provide some stabilizations. It can be located on the proximal surface extended from a prepared margin ridge to the junction of the middle and the jimbo third of abutment tubes. We also have the clasp arm. The clasp arm could be divided by two. One is the reciprocal, one is the retentive or retention arm. The reciprocal arm should be located in the middle third of the tubes. And the retentive arm should be uh, located into the gingival third of the tubes with the undercut. So when we uh, try to design or find a proper path of placement for the direct retainer, we want to follow the KISS principle. It means that the most suitable path of placement means we require least amount of mouse preparations. So ideally, you want to find a proper path of, of placement which you don't need to do the mouse or tooth preparations. That will be the most ideal of a pass of placement. Also, the, those pass of placement should prevent the huge tissue undercut, which may interfere with the placement of the RPD framework. Before we move into the indirect retainers part, I want to spend some time to explain the principle of retention. How can we get retentions for the clasp arm? So, how we get retentions? The clasp retentions is based on the resistance to deformation of the metal. So when we have a metal deformation, when the metal arm try to pass through the hyper contour, then it will be stopped by the tubes. So those force provided by the tubes will cause the deformation of the middle arm. So you will try to have a class retention. So for those class need to be retentive, it should be placed into an undercut location, which will be below to the hyper contour, or what we call the survey line. So when it try to dislodge, then you will have uh, deformations, then you will have the retentions. 
So it means that we will have several factors will cause the different retentions or different resistance. The first is about the tools. So when we have a different tools morphologies, it will create a different hive contour. When we have a different hive contour locations, it will cause the different depths of undercut. When the depth of undercut is more, then the retention will be more. We also have some processes factors. Basically, depends on the class flexibilities. When the class is more flexible, the retention is less. We have four different factors could uh, affect the flexibility of the class. First, the class length. When we have a more longer class arm, then you will have more flexibilities. However, it will also affect by the cross sections of the shape. For example, for bar clasp, the length of the bar clasp is usually longer than the circumferential clasp. However, its flexibility will be less than the circumferential clasp because it has a half round form which will be lying to a several plants provided the resistance. We also have a diameters factors. When the class become more wider, then it will become less flexible. A cross-sections form. So flexibilities may exist in any form. However, when we have a half round form, that which is existing in the bar type, it will limit it to one direction to discharge this kind of clasp. So you will provide less flexibilities. However, that just only one universal flexible form is the round shape form. However, it is impossible happen when we do RPD framework by casting method. Also, the material itself will cause the different flexibilities or retentions. When we have the same size, the raw wires material will provide the most flexible result. The cast gold will be the second. The chromium cobalt alloy will be the most rigid material in the same size. However, even we said the old casting alloy using the diff, uh, the partial dentures constructions pose some flexibilities. Their flexibilities is still proportionate to its bulk. So if we have more wider uh, materials which we use, they will provide more retentions and less flexibilities. Now, let's talk about the indirect retainers. When we need indirect retainers, basically when we have distal extension RPD, which is the class 1 or class 2 cases, because when it try to dislodge on the distal extension removal partial dentures, it has a tendency it will rotate it around the focal line. Those movement can be resisted by the direct retainer, the stabilizing component of the class assembly, also can be resisted by the rigid component of the, the framework which located on opposing side of the focal line away from the distortion basis, which is what we call indirect retainers. The ideal location for indirect retainers should be placed as far as possible from the distal extension basis, which can provide it the base leverage advantage against dislodgement. Remember, in the first beginning, when we discussed the component of the RPD framework, I asked you to think about a seesaw. When we have a distal extension basis and we have a force try to dislodge, then those seesaw's movements were moving up in the back, so the anterior were moving down. That's why we have to have something in the front to stop its sinking. 
That's why we need indirect retainers. And consider about the principle of leverage, or principle of a lever. Then, when you have a more distance between the fulcrum to the indirect retainer, you will provide this force to the tubes. So, how do we determine the location of the indirect retainer? First of all, we have to find out where is your fulcrum line. The fulcrum line is located on two most posterior rest seat on your framework. So first of all, you have to locate it, the most two posterior rest on your framework, then connect it by an imaginary line. Then you draw the other imaginary line perpendicular to the fulcrum line. Then you want to find out the most anterior teeth on that direction in the front. That would be your indirect retainer locations. However, when you use this principle to locate the ideal location of an indirect retainer, you used to find out the incisor tooth will be on that location. However, considering about the incisor teeth uh, size is not strong enough to support indirect retainer. Also, some incisor teeth has a very steep incline, which is not a favorable location to support a rest. So, in this situation, then you will likely to choose the nearest canine or the mesocusal surface of the first premolar to provide to be the indirect retainer locations. If you choose the canine or first premolars uh, as your uh, locations for the indirect retainer, ideally you would like to use two indirect retainers close to the focal line because we are not choosing the ideal positions for the indirect retainers followed by the principal. So we already compromise in distance. So we try to use one more indirect retainers to compensate those compromised distance. So you just need to know if you have low circumstances, you would like more likely to use the canine and premolar rather than the central or lateral incisors.